This summer, the drumbeat about the American middle class continues. The long decline of overall wages and mobility was fodder for the presidential campaign last year, shining a glare on the difference in momentum of those at the top. The Occupy Wall Street movement continued the message, and new reports on the differences show the middle class, and especially the poor, may be losing ground. Good evening. I'm Doug Price, and this is Colorado Quarterly for August 2013. Tonight on Colorado Quarterly, we welcome Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist Hedrick Smith, whose book, Who Stole the American Dream, was published in 2012. In it, he traces the slow decline of the U.S. middle class over the past 35 years since an important change in who could lobby Congress in 1978. Also with us is Jessica Peck, director of the Open Government Institute, a bipartisan, nonprofit election transparency organization. Jessica calls herself a conservative Republican, and Hedrick has a more traditional progressive lens on his reporting. In this case, these are my words, not his. Hedrick, first give us the snapshot of your work on this book. What did you find? Well, in, in four or five years ago, we all knew America was in trouble. We knew the middle class was in trouble. And I was interested in how we went from being a country where we had a prosperous middle class that shared in the wealth and the gains of the economy, and, and we had an effective functioning bipartisan politics to the present situation where we have polarized politics, can't get much done in Washington. You have gross inequalities of income. Top people at the top 1% in the last 35 years got 84% of the income gains of the entire country. And the middle class is stuck in the rut. I mean, you still have high unemployment, you have phone home foreclosures, you have people who can't afford to send their kids to college, you have people struggling. So how do we get there? That's what interested me. And, and in the end, I came up with who stole the American dream. Perfect. Jessica, tell us what you believe the American dream to be. I think I'm living it for the most part. Um, I get to do a job I love being a lawyer and I get to be a mom to my kids. In large part, I think that uh, my ability to put a roof over my kid's house, or, uh, I'm sorry, a roof over my house. Thank, God, my they, they, yes. thank, thank God the house has a roof. Exactly. I guess. <laughs> um, but my ability to do that is because I was spared from just the massive consumption and predatory lending associated with student loans and bad mortgages. I'm 34 years old and I'm probably one of my, uh, just a handful of um, people in my social circles of this age who doesn't have sixty seventy eighty thousand dollars in student loan debt and who isn't underwater on a mortgage still even though we hear all of this great news about uh, the housing market recovering people are still really suffering. Jessica is right and it, the, the, there was a loss of six trillion dollars mm -hmm. by American homeowners uh, from the late 1980s until 2009 they were losing money during the housing boom for precisely the reason Jessica just said. They were, they were taking out second loans, they were refinancing their houses, they were hit with high interest bubble era loans, and they were going deeper and deeper into debt. And the government loved it, the Federal Reserve loved it because this was consumer borrowing, people were going into debt, and that was what was pushing the economy, and then it blew up in our faces. Well, I, I think in some ways it may have masked uh, inequality in income, which I wanna talk about. I wanna talk about uh, educational issues, but let me ask you this question, uh, Jessica. Has the American dream, dream been stolen? If it's been stolen by anything or anyone, it's that we have become victims of whatever challenges we face. There was a time when students would go and work a couple jobs or live at home with their parents to go to school, and now everybody wants to go to a fancy campus and the universities do nothing to stop them from doing that. Uh, yes, things are tough, but we still have so much opportunity. And I truly believe that every kid in this country could go to college if that is the golden ticket for the middle class. I don't believe it is. I think we send too many people to college and we're too elitist when it comes to our ability to produce a future generation of workers that actually can sustain and supply what America actually will need in the future. Terrific. Well, one of the great parts about the book, Who Stole the American Dream, Hedrick, is, the, is, is sort of the, the case statement that I think that was, we've talked about this issue whether right or left people pretty much accept the case statement. So can you talk a little bit about the, the key elements that led to this perception or actuality of decline? Well, if you go back and look at the earlier period, we had business leaders 
in uh, General Motors, Charlie Wilson, in General Electric, Reg Jones, uh, at, at Standard Oil of New Jersey, Frank Abrams, who believed in what uh, social commentators and economists call stakeholder capitalism. Mm -hmm. That is, you share the wealth. All the groups that have a stake in the success of the economy and of the corporation should share in the fruits of it. So what you see uh, when this is going on from the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, is you see the kind of worker that Jessica was just talking about, who has skills, maybe doesn't go to college, who works in an assembly line, works uh, as a plumber or, or, or an electrician, uh, runs a small business. You see their standard of living at the middle of the American economy, rising as the economy gets more productive and more efficient. And what you see from the 70s onward is the economy continues to produce highly, mm -hmm. but the gains don't go to the middle class. There's a leveling. If you take the average male worker from 1978 to 2011, adjusted for inflation, mm -hmm. they make the same pay and compensation benefits in 2011 and 1978. So that's three decades of going nowhere. These are people who have skills. These are people who are needed in the economy. These are people who have steady jobs and they've gone nowhere. Meanwhile, the cost of health care, the cost of education, the cost of a house has gone skyrocketing well above inflation. So that's what's happened. I mean, the pie is now cut up differently in America than it was cut up back in that earlier period. And that's the real difference. The money has flowed to the top, as I just said, 84% to the top 1%. And your book, in a lot of ways, really starts with the conversation of what happened in the early 70s under, under Nixon. It w wasn't under anybody else in terms of what happened. This fear that uh, business was plan what was was actually losing its power and needed to play an increasing role. Jessica, when you look at sort of the case statement, the problem statement, what are the elements that you believe contributed, do you believe it contributed to decline? And if so, what are the elements you thought that did, did that? Well, we live a very different existence as America than we did 30 or 40 years ago. Um, even th some of the poorest families have iPads or everybody's expected to have a cell phone or an iPhone. We consume things that were never part of the equation. And if you figure the average family probably spends $300, $400 a month on cable, internet, cell phone, and technology a month, that alone is a huge uh, part of the pie. But certainly the greatest contributing forces to our current uh, ongoing economic crisis are health care, cost of education, and housing. And those are three areas that are almost exclusively funded through debt or at least um, an outside, a third party source of funding. So we have consumers that buy things based on what the payment is today without having an adequate understanding of interest rates or how uh, their economic situation is going to look. 10 or 15 years from now. So there's not an investment philosophy. Hedrick, when you look at some of these issues, let, let's focus a little bit on uh, the problems associated with education. How do you see the educational system as a contributor to the decline if you do it all? I do, actually. Um, it's really a tragedy because we were the country that pioneered public education uh -huh. in the world. Uh -huh. And we now have a public education system that we're fighting about because it's inadequate. Um, and education was seen for a long time as the great leveler in American society. If you were born at the bottom, if you came from a broken home, if you came from a poor family, if you could get yourself educated, if you could do what Jessica's done and gone through school and gone through graduate school and gone to law school, you get what Jessica was just talking about. She is living the dream. She is a professional. And the reason is she's got a really solid education. What we found out in the last 50 or 20 years in particular, that education has now become the great divider. I'm sorry, all the poor families don't have all the electronic goods you've got. What we have in America today in many ways is an electronic divide. You have inner city schools that are cut off, you know, and it's terrible because it's very important if you want to become a modern American to have access to that. So what's happened is, and what you see is, we're no longer the land of opportunity. You can't rise as easily today in America as you can in Denmark or Finland or Germany or France. I mean, there, there are all kinds of comparative studies that show whether or not people can make it up the ladder. And that's what we are, a, a country of opportunity. And one of the main reasons is lack of access to education. The cost of education yeah. is astronomical today. For, for middle class, for working poor families, it's, um, it's way beyond their budgets. And often many of them don't even understand that kids could get scholarships. They're just not connected to that part of society. 
And that's a terrible tragedy. We're wasting all kinds of human talent within our system, within our society, because we're not educating our future. That's our seed corn. And I think consumption is way different than investment. And Jessica made the comment quietly, I hope the audience heard it, that uh, there is a difference between an Xbox and an iPad. The, the ability to have digital resources inside the home is transformative. The, the ability to have great education inside the home is transformative. There's a reason that we spend three times the federal subsidy here at, at Rocky Mountain PBS to make sure that every child in Colorado has an air signal into his or her home with great educational programming. And so we looked at that and I think that we're cognizant of a growing divide between the haves and have-nots in terms of their access to information. Sure. And information is accelerating at a rapid pace. And just on that note, I mean, you make a really good point about the digital divide, and I don't know what the latest numbers are, but there's a huge percentage of poor Americans, and particularly minorities, who don't have uh, a computer or access to you know, technology as far as sending resumes, as far as doing research taking online classes. As we've adapted to smaller and smaller technology, many children may be growing up with an iPad or a, a, f a cell phone in their home, but they don't have a home computer, and that can create a lot of obstacles. It seems like a very simple mm -hmm. thing, but if you have a limited budget, you, it makes more sense to have the iPhone than it does to have the home computer. We're talking about geography now. You, you, you slipped that in, uh, and where people are matters. Uh, David Leonard of the, the New York Times, uh, you may have seen the article that he wrote in July in which he gathers together a lot of evidence about the effect of geography on whether or not children have a chance to rise above poverty. There's an impressive online map with these stories that helps you see the differences. You can interact with this map yourself at the New York Times website. This was published on July 22nd to make it easier to access. In red are all the places where a child's chance of success is only around 4% or less. A lot of the red is in the southeast. Memphis, Tennessee's figure is only 2.6%. The chances of rising. The chances of rising for somebody uh, in the in the bottom uh, uh, the bottom uh, quintile, the blue and green on the map shows the places where opportunity. I think the bottom ten percent. The ju the blue and green on the map shows where places where opportunity is higher. You can see swaths of those colors from the top of North Dakota and down. Salt Lake City and its metropolitan area have one of the highest numbers, twenty seven point three percent. Carter's counties vary, but here in Denver, the overall chance of making it from poverty into the middle class is 8.3%. And here's what Raj Chetty, the most recent winner of the John Bates Clark Medal for the best academic economist under 40 says. The best four predictors of social mobility are, are in order. One, economic integration by neighborhood, Salt Lake City. Two, level of two parent families, the higher the better. Three, quality of schools, early childhood, elementary and high school. College is not a big determinant uh, of what makes a difference. Uh, and finally, higher levels of engagement civically, including participation in religious and community groups, that connection to where we are. Th these are really traditional values. But so let's talk about solutions. Think about what you just said. 8.3% yeah. chance of rising from the bottom to the middle, yeah. not to the top. Yeah. Think how slim those odds are. Mm -hmm. One in 12 kids will make it if they try hard mm -hmm. to make it to the middle. That is not the way America used to be. The numbers would have been much higher. Uh -huh. I don't have the numbers, but yeah. the numbers would have been much higher if you went back 30 or 40 years. And a lot of that has to do with, with the attitudes of, of people. Communities were closer together. We had a sense of community. Uh, corporations operated much more as, mm -hmm. as, as communities. Uh, and in, in, in honesty, some government programs that would have helped those kids, Head Start and so forth, they're being cut. Mm -hmm. So the kids who are starting out at the bottom, mm -hmm. who need the help, because the parents may not be engaged. They may be working too hard. They may have a busted family. They may have somebody on drugs. They need help from outside to get a start to get that opportunity. And we're cutting that away right now. So that's part of what's, what I meant when I said who stole the American dream. There were decisions we made. It didn't just happen because of globalization and technology. There were decisions made in government. There were decisions made in the private sector. There were decisions made mm -hmm. in states and in communities about how the resources and how the money would be spent. And that's had a big effect on that 8.3% that you just so, said. So, so I want to get to both of you on that. But uh, in, in your book, you talk about the 1978 Congress, the changes in lobbying, and the changes in lobbying may have changed the priorities that Congress or state legislators had. Talk about that a little bit, and I want you to think about okay. the, the force of money in politics. Well, people don't stop and think about how much money is connected to power, but it is. Um, uh, 
in the era of the middle class prosperity, the middle class exercised a lot of power politically. There was a women's movement that pushed mm -hmm. women's pay up significantly. There was a consumer's movement that had a big impact on the way corporate America delivered products and labeled products and the safety of products. A strong labor movement that negotiated for good contracts, good benefits and so forth. You had a power shift. Mm -hmm. And in the late 70s, you had what, what some people call a revolt of the bosses. You had a big shift, a yeah. big engagement of business. They began to lobby uh, Washington significantly. There was a growth of business mm -hmm. organizations in Washington. More companies moved uh, their offices to Washington. 1971, 175 companies had offices in Washington. A decade later, 2,425. Yeah. 9,000 registered corporate lobbyists. The mm -hmm. same number of corporate PR people. We still see that today. Consumers are fundamentally not very well represented in Washington. Labor is outspent by business 60 to 1 in lobbying in Washington. So no wonder Congress is listening to the people who have put the money into the effort, hired the experts, you know, argued about policy. So you see tax rates coming down on the top. You see the payroll tax rising. It, it's doubled while the top tax rate's been coming down. You see estate tax rates coming down, and you see the minimum wage rising slowly. So the people at the bottom are not getting government help, and the people at the top are getting it. Jessica, you're our self-professed conservative uh, 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 conversationalist. Give us a sense. Do you agree with that premise, uh, or do you have a, a, dis a differing view? You know, I, I want to just lay it out there that I, I believe very strongly that we have an opportunity to make America great again. And I think that we are on the decline. I think that money is a problem. But a lot of this has been fueled by um, the rural or sort of subsistence living that a lot of Americans did in a agricultural days uh, gone by. And now we've got urban communities or suburban urban fringe communities. So when we look at all of these problems and we look, about, look at the power of the middle class, certainly those conservative values, I'm very libertarian, <laughs> I'm not a social conservative, but those values, the simple economic premise that two adults in a household are better equipped to serve a child than a single parent family, that's huge. 80% of the kids who were left behind, victims of Hurricane Katrina, had never lived under the same roof as their father. So when it comes to lobbying and it comes to all of these things, my optimism it, it stems from the fact that teen pregnancy rates are down. That's huge, of course. Um, we can't have a country where 15-year-olds are having babies and there's 35-year-old grandmothers and expect to succeed. But also with education and technology and all of these things, we're taking power out of the corporations, the corporate corporation that is higher education in this country. And we have Stanford professors and University of Virginia offering free business classes. Well, I, th I think an interesting issue is, again, you, you keep mentioning geography. When you, you looked at the David Lennart map, what it talked about, the geography actually had inverted in a way. Urban areas weren't as successful in terms of the social mobility that they tended to be in more rural areas. Uh, we talked about fracking and other, uh, other mining and uh, uh, energy activities that created what we call uh, tradable versus non-tradable jobs. The non-tradable jobs were, were, were domiciled there. So I want to think about those issues of what our job core looks like by quoting uh, President George Washington uh, from the first annual message to Congress in uh, 1790. What he said, a free people ought not only be armed but disciplined and their safety and interest required that they should promote such, manufact such manufactories as tend to render them independent of others for essential, particularly military supplies. We do have a Western peer in Germany who has gone a totally different direction. So talk a little bit about the importance of manufacturing or non-tradable jobs. Well, there's no question that the manufacturing jobs have been not only the core of the American economy, its strength during its mm -hmm. long, great period, uh, but they've been the source of the best paying jobs mm -hmm. and the best benefits. And so they've really supported the middle class. And they actually did what you were talking about before, Jessica. They were helping two, two parent families hold together because they could make it financially. Uh, and, and we've lost that. What's interesting is um, many people said to me, you know, when you're talking about America, uh, you should look at some other countries and see what's going on. So I started looking for other countries that face the same challenges we do, because we do have cheaper labor in China and cheaper labor in India and, and, and the rest of Asia. And, and there is a tendency to, to see the great sucking sound, as Ross Perot put it, of jobs going to China and India and so forth like that. So I thought about what's another industrial country? And I began to look at, at, at Germany, which is the fourth largest trading power in the world. And the Germans have taken a very different kind of strategic 
strategic direction and vision. They, they pay a lot of attention to training their workforce. They don't, mm -hmm. they, Jessica, I couldn't agree with you more. We should, we're sending too many kids to college. We think college is the be all and the end all. The Germans believe really strongly in training good people at high school level with really good technical and, and mechanical skills. So they're the people who are working in the clean rooms Mm -hmm. of the chip fabs, which is a very sophisticated job, but it doesn't require a bachelor or a master's degree. Uh, the people who work as technicians in hospitals, uh, and the people who do the drafting for architects, all kinds of technical mm -hmm. level jobs. The Germans train hard, and then they work on quality production. Mm -hmm. And they have an export surplus when we have an export deficit. Mm -hmm. They have 21% yeah. of their people in manufacturing, we have 9%. Uh, you know, uh, they, they pay higher wages to their middle class workers than we do. I like American it. companies say we can't compete, the Germans are competing and doing it really well. So maybe there's something we uh, could learn. I like it when you give me the facts I was ready to ask you about. Uh, one of the questions I ask of you, Jessica, is uh, as a libertarian, is there a role for government to play in shaping the economy to be more productive? Certainly, and um, you know, sometimes that means more regulation. More often than not, it means less regulation. But when we talk about the middle class, I think it's critically important that we talk about um, the often neglected variable in compensation, and that is fringe benefits. The average federal employee in this country makes eight to twelve percent more than a similarly situated private sector employee, and that's before you get to pensions. That's before you get to uh, the fringe benefits that mm -hmm. often provide um, an economic value to families but aren't quantified through a, a, a dollar value, such as um, family leave or paid vacation. In the city of Denver alone, if, for the most senior, uh, most senior employees can g take up to two months off a year paid. And that includes uh, family leave, that includes bereavement, that also includes vacation, sick time, and others. I, I, wanna, I wanna think about the private sector a little bit or the relationship between the private sector and government as we, as we think about closing. Uh, I wanna quote Klaus, uh, Klaus Kleinfeld, who's now the Alcoa CEO, used to run Siemens, a German, one of the great German industrialists. And he says, uh, one, of the, one, of the, one key to Germany's success, the social contract, the willingness of business, labor, and political leaders to put aside some of their differences and make agreements in the national interest. Are there things that we should do to create? We, I don't think, in my opinion, we have an industrial policy. Are there things we should do to create an industrial policy that leads us to a, a more stable future? Uh, well, it's an interesting abstract question, but to make it concrete, we did actually have an uh -huh. industrial policy. We saved the banks. Uh -huh. That was a bailout. It was a government bailout for banks. It wasn't industry, but it was the government stepping in and saying, we got to save the banks, because if the banks go down, we all go down. Mm -hmm. And industrial policy, they said, we got to save the auto industry. Yes, now, what's really interesting, apropos of what Klaus Kleinfeld said was, Obama and the government go in and they bail out the auto, in, auto companies. And a lot of people said, no, let them fail. Let mm -hmm. the market work. And, the, and Obama and others said, no, they're too important. That's an industrial policy. What's interesting is what's come out afterwards. Government steps back. Government gets paid back. And now we're in the private sector. And we're seeing Klaus Kleinfeld being applied in the auto industry today by Americans. It's, it's a great thing. And we ought to take note of it because it's really positive and it's in the private sector. The, the, the managers of General Motors and Ford and Chrysler have gone to the United Auto Workers Union, the union, and said, look, we got to make a profit in order to survive. We need your help. We want you to agree that we can hire new workers at lower wages than the current workers are making. Now, in the trade union movement's history, that is anathema. And the trade union leaders came back to them and said, yes, we'll agree to that if you will agree not to move the auto production plants to Mexico that you were planning to move to Mexico and you'll bring back some production from China. And they agreed on that. Both sides said, we have a larger stake here. We have a common good. We want the company to survive and we want the workers to survive. Each side made a sacrifice to the other and it's working. That's something we should really applaud. Uh, whenever people ask me what my, my political persuasion is, I'm, I'm with PBS, I can't tell you. But I do think of myself as a capitalist, and capitalism had a balance between capital, labor, and innovation, reward to innovation. Uh, you've, you've looked at the, the higher ed system. I have an anxiety about what the higher uh, ed system produces. Do you believe that the return on innovation is going to be a spur to STEM education? Um, yes and no. I'm encouraged to see that there are so many professors or 
leaders within the academy who are offering opportunities to get educated outside the traditional dinosaur. But it is frustrating to me. We see University of Denver, where I graduated from law school, the average student loan debt is close to $100,000. And in this country, on average, and of course this is a, a gross generality here, but it takes the average college-educated uh, worker to, until they do not catch up with their high school or, or their peers that only went to graduated from high school until they are 36 years old. I had a client the other day in court. She will be paying a thousand dollars a month on her student loans until she is 65 we're, years old. We're not going to have time to exactly to talk about college, but I think that a couple of things to think about in the state of Colorado. There's been an inversion of public support. Ten years ago, 70 percent of the tuition and fees for a student would have been paid by the by the state in a in a public school. Today, that's 30 percent. So, totally inverted in in. in Ten it's years. a different model. Yeah, uh, at the beginning of the Bush administration, uh, George W. Bush, uh, the United States was the undisputed leader in the production of undergraduate degrees for uh, f per capita. Today, we're number 17. So there's changes in what we do. So let's close by thinking about infrastructure. We only have about a minute left. What are your thoughts about the needs of infrastructure? You know, two, one or two. Yeah. The U.S. Chamber of Commerce says we've lost a trillion dollars worth of growth because our ports, airports, railroads, bridges, uh, highways are so out of date. It takes as long to move a freight train through the city of Chicago, 12 miles, as 2,000 miles from LA to Chicago. So they're saying we got to modernize, we got to invest. And that would generate jobs, that would make us more globally competitive. Uh, it makes a lot of sense. I mean, there are a lot of things we could do. We could lower the corporate tax rate and close uh, corporate tax loopholes. We could train the workers that get thrown out of work you know, by, by globalization. Yeah. There are a lot of things we can do. J Jessica, one quick comment. We need to have a cap on salaries of public employees at those debt-funded institutions, higher education, uh, within the mortgage industry, and also with healthcare. With that, <laughs> I'll say controversial talk. We've run out of time for this quor Colorado Quarterly in August tw 2013. Thank you to Hedrick Smith, and thank you to My Jessica pleasure. Peck. Thank you for tuning in tonight and for your ongoing support of Rocky Mountain PBS. I'm President and CEO Doug Price. Good night.